Hello and welcome back to the Wild Ones podcast, the show where we chat about bike stuff. This week, the prodigal son has returned. Francis Cade is back in the motherfucking building! <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, if you didn't already know, Francis has been away filming a bikepacking trip in Malaysia. Uh, I watched some of it. I didn't watch it all because generally I find you quite boring. Um, but if you can just, I don't know, give us, give us a little recap on how it went. I haven't watched it either. And actually it was Singapore as well as Malaysia, although we were only in Singapore for 40 kilometers, maybe less. We left as soon as we could because very, very expensive there. There was a point where uh, you messaged me and said, I've just, uh, I'm, I'm staying with uh, Dan Coops and I've just bought some food for everyone and it's really, really expensive. So when you see it, don't. don't, don't <laughs> oh, yeah, I actually messaged you. <laughs> Thanks, Cade Media. <laughs> we now have no money. <laughs> So yeah, you know, how was the trip? Amazing. Um, what an incredible place. Like I've been to Southeast Asia before. So I was expecting uh, a similar experience to what I'd had. However, I'd never been to Malaysia. Everyone speaks English. Everyone's so friendly. The roads were buttery smooth. Um, I think as an entry point to experiencing Southeast Asia, I think it would be one of the best places to start, um, particularly for a bike trip because it was just very... Um, compatible with cycling long distance every day. Well, long distance. We did four or five hours every day. It was very hot, but that was the only real challenge. Everything else was quite easy. Um, so we had a, a fantastic time. How How is it um, something that I'm always concerned about with riding bikes, basically in any country? Um, were there dogs and or animals that wanted to eat you? Uh, unlike Vietnam, where the dogs would see us, <laughs> They'd look at us in the middle of the road and then they'd run away, get their friends, <laughs> and tell them all, oh, there's some cyclists coming. And then a thousand dogs would come out and try and kill you. Yeah. The dogs here would just, dogs in Malaysia would just chill. Just chill. Yeah. Like, oh, they'd, hey, what's they'd, up? they'd see you and they'd nod. What's up, and what's they'd up go, dudes? Yeah, right. All right. Okay, media. Yeah. Sick. And then you just ride past and they'd just be there, lazing in the sun. Food? What was the food like? Incredible. Um, I think people from Singapore would say their food's better. People in Malaysia would say their food's better. And I liked both. It was it, the, we realized the more rough around the edges, the places looked, the better the food was. Right. Um, so there'd be some places where we just, we, we had to stop. We were starving and we were like, oh, should we like, this is the only option. And then we were proven wrong over and over again because the food was the best in those places and it's just amazing. If, if, uh, so they have influence, they're Indian influence, Chinese influence. It's all just a big melting pot of different cuisines. And the standard is so high that we didn't have a bad meal there at all. I, um, if you didn't know, I used to work in finance. One of you the only lads, mentioned it once a week. No, yeah, I, haven't, I usually don't mention that, I keep it quiet. Uh, one of the guys I used to work with, um, Mark was from Singapore. Two, two interesting things that I learned from, from spending a couple of years hanging out with him. One, there is national service in Singapore. So he was spent, I think, two years in the military. And he basically says it was like fat camp and they just kind of, he got sent there to try and lose a bit of weight and he just didn't do anything. Um, and the other thing is he used to get enraged. Have you ever heard of Singapore noodles, which is like basically on every single British Chinese menu, Singapore noodles? Yeah. He's just like enraged by it. He's like, that isn't a thing. There's no such thing as Singapore noodles. And I'll be like, well, it is. It says so. I, I know we're not in Singapore, but it says here Singapore noodles. So yeah, apparently Singapore noodles is not a thing. Mm. There are noodles. Lots of noodles. They're just They're noodles. Noodles for <laughs> breakfast, <laughs> which uh, I was like, mm, I don't want to do that on the first day. And then I got into it. And then by the end of the trip, I was like, I don't bread, eggs. No, thanks. I'm having the noodle thing. You get the little peanuts on the side. There's a name for it. Uh, the... Malaysian viewers will be very upset with me because I've forgotten what it's called. It's one of their main dishes. And uh, you, you have like egg, you have noodles. And then for some reason they put anchovies, which I don't like that bit. I would take them off. Um, and then some peanuts with the skin on still. And then you kind of mix it all up, put some spicy sauce on. That is breakfast food. That sounds Elite lush. breakfast food, honestly. Producer Emily is also here, of course. How have you been? Oh, yeah, um, I'm very well, although I've had a bit of a nightmare week actually trying to get this podcast prep done because it's April and I despise April. And the reason I despise April is because of April Fool's Day. 
So when your job is to try and find news stories for us to talk about for the show, April Fool's Day makes it really annoying. So I've been sifting through websites, having to double check every single story that I've found to make sure it's real or not. I almost got hooked in. I added what, if I, if I see stuff during the week, I usually just add it to a, my, my notes folder. And one of the things I had on there was an April Fool's joke. However, I thought that we could make the most of this and do a little game. So I've, I've compiled some headlines. I do love a game. They're real headlines that have appeared in the news. However, some of them are April Fool's jokes, not real stories. So I'm going to read them out and you're going to tell me whether you think they're true or false. Oh, however, I'm excited about this. however, don't get too excited. Ah! Listen, we had a lot of feedback that um, <laughs> when we play games, Jim, Jimmy really likes to give the answer within 0.2 seconds and it doesn't give, give the viewers time to play along. So I'm invoking a new rule. You're not allowed to talk over me and you have to wait three seconds before you yep. can give your answer. Okay. First headline is Geraint Thomas forced to delete a section of his podcast after guest Luke Raw called Nairo Quintana a little fucking rat. Three, two, one, go. You may answer. So we we need to answer whether we think this was real or an April Fool. Yes. Okay. Um so Geraint Thomas and Luke Raw, you also may not know that I'm from Cardiff. <laughs> And, you know, we all know each other. Um, they are lads. I think it could be true. I'm going true as well. It is true. But, yes! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I feel like they would have said it in a nice way. Reading it there, it sounds horrible, doesn't it? But it was like, oh, he's a little f***ing rat. Do you want to hear the clip? Because someone recorded it before oh, I went off Oh, yes, please. Okay. He's going to be there or thereabouts. To be honest, I, I don't know who else is doing it. Um, Quintana's doing it. He shouldn't even nah, be racing. No, no. Um, Little fucking rat. <laughs> <laughs> That's so bad. Why? Why is it so outrageous? So so the background to this is during a discussion about possible contenders for this year's Giro, Quintana's name came up. Geraint says he shouldn't even be racing, which is presumably it's thought to be a comment in relation to Quintana's tramadol related disqualification uh, from the Tour de France in, okay. uh, Tour de France in 2022. And then Luke Raw replies. Oh, uh, fair. Know. They probably know more. Well, they clearly know well, more. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Isn't Quintana about 50 years old now? <laughs> One moment, caller. I will check. <laughs> Mm. 34. 34? More importantly, how good does Luke Rowe's microphone sound compared to Garrett Thomas's? Well, they used... They, I, I'm sure they just use, like... Is it iPhone? Well, they do... Well, I don't know. I guess they do this? whatever. I guess they do whatever they can do because they do it whilst getting massaged. And In stuff, a hotel room, yeah. yeah. So, yes, that one was true. Next one. Oh, that was, that was fantastic. Thanks, guys. Next headline. These airbag bib shorts with self-inflating straps could be a potential game changer for the pro peloton. Three... Two, one, go. I'm going to ask Francis first. False. April Fool. Jimmy? False. I, I say false because a bib strap inflating isn't going to really... Do, oh, no, because your collarbone. Oh, I'm flipping. I'm saying true. Like I think, a hovding. I think, I think it's collarbone protection. Like a hovding. A hovding I, helmet. I assume so, yeah. Mm. I, think it's, I think it's true and it's designed to protect the collarbone in a crash. It is true. Yes, there's a story going around about these airbag shorts prototypes that have been developed by the former head of R&D for BioRacer. He's a guy called Sam Ratajak. I hope I've said that correctly. And that he now works for a design company called SID Sports Innovation Design. So he revealed these shorts prototypes in a recent LinkedIn post where he said, crashing is part of cycling as crying is part of love, which is incredibly poetic. And <laughs> he's convinced that they could be a potential game changer for safety in the peloton. So the shorts essentially look like a normal pair of bib shorts, uh, but the strap is sort of lined with some inflatables, which I imagine uh, look something like those long balloons at kids' parties mm. that get turned into sausage dogs. Um, but the idea is that they would inflate on impact like a hovding and protect the chest, the back, the collarbone, I guess, something like that. So he has invented these shorts. Um, however, he says, despite reaching out to some of the wealthiest teams in the peloton, we encountered limited interest. However, advancements in technology and ongoing analysis of the cycling accidents suggests that the concept of cycling airbags could evolve into smarter, more effective safety solution over time. And he's saying anyone 
that has interest in further exploring the concept, he's all ears. So they are an, uh, a prototype at this point. They have not been taken on. However, this is a real headline and some guy really made these shorts. Wow. Yes. I think this is going after pro cycling seems to be the wrong avenue. It's a commuter thing. Well, pro cyclists don't want extra stuff. There's that. That's... Yes, but if it means that they can race pre-season or the early classics and all of those kind of races and still be in a state that they can race the Grand Tours. Well, it's better, consider, it's this perfect is an, example exactly, of what's exactly. just happened. So actually, it might be something that you wouldn't necessarily use on the Grand Tour, but you might use it in the classics because there's, there's a higher chance of crashing. But you still want to do the race because it's just good prep, isn't it, you know? Mm. Mm. Yeah, I assumed that the pro cycling angle was more about getting money towards the development. And also, I guess it acts as a bit of marketing, isn't it? It's like if they take it on, then they show that there's a need for it. I'm not sure. But anyway, will it get off the ground? Who knows? But there you go. Real headline. Okay, next one. So I'm winning then, aren't I? 2-1. Yeah. Uh, next one, a nutrition company have created a Pez-like dispenser specifically engineered to dispense effervescent electrolyte tablets three two one go i am honestly really enjoying this this section of the podcast this is this <laughs> is this is the best thing we've ever done i love it Thanks. we can only do it once a year yeah <laughs> sorry jimmy i'm always looking for new and interesting ways to make this fun so i'm glad that it's appreciated okay okay uh pez dispenser for electrolyte tablets that seems plausible um i'm going to say it is true true this one is false yeah. this was an april fools but shouldn't it exist well yeah it, it's a it's a rubbish april fools because it's like people would buy it well yeah, yeah. Sturka did that. <laughs> that that's not the point the point of it like an april fools is, is meant to be something that's like obscene well so that catches you but still is ridiculous so this was a joke put out by precision fuel and hydration who shared actual patent paint that word Patent? Patent. Okay. Patent. Patent. <laughs> Who shared patent drawings of their, they called it a Fez dispenser, P-H-E-S-Z. What teams <laughs> do they sponsor? Because they could do little know. bobble head, you know, like the head on top. Blech. Yeah. Sicking up a Pez, a Fez. Yeah. Of each of the team riders. And then you, the people would want to collect them all. Exactly. Exactly. And then they'd it's sell a really loads good of idea. A really good idea. Yes. Yeah. That that works if teams are like football clubs and people actually get behind the team and and the the players are relatively consistent. I but. collect them. I'm not <laughs> sure whether Pez is maybe a um, trademarked concept. Oh, well, definitely know. will be. Yeah, so yeah. maybe the actual dispenser is trademarked. I don't know. But anyway, they shared these patent drawings. They're sort of it's, it is like a little guy's head. Yeah. So that one was false, but I think there's something in that. If if it existed, I would buy it. Would you? Yes. <laughs> I don't think you would. I think <laughs> you like the idea of it, but you wouldn't actually. I buy do it. like the idea of it. Yeah. Um, they also they said that it was uh, uh, it was said to be aerodynamically designed and could be integrated onto your bike to oh, optimize airflow. Off. Well, that's but that's right, the funny yeah, bit now, about now, it. Yeah, optimize it, airflow to provide performance benefits. It's a funny that like that. If that was at the forefront of yeah. what you read out, then yeah, we would have. I, I would have been straight in with that being fake. Okay, next one. You can now buy beef stew flavoured energy gels for those who are sick of sweet bike nutrition. Three, two, one, go. Francis, I'm going to you first. True. This could, this could be true, couldn't it? Do you think it, is it like, if it is true, like a beef and tomato pot noodle, which doesn't have any beef in it? Yes, the, yeah, yeah. It's vegetarian. And like the chicken, um, Uncle Ben's rice doesn't have any chicken mm. in it as well good idea i um used to work at a care home and one of the residents asked me for to get them e-cigarettes yeah and i was like oh yeah they've got different flavors and i was like what flavor do you want she said meat flavor meat flavor yeah they didn't they didn't have any meat flavor ones at the shop there is a market for it there is yeah i, I think it is um an april fool's it is an April Fool's. Yes, this was a joke started by... Disappointed! Disappointed! This was a joke started by Cycling in Flanders tourist organisation. Apparently beef stew and Belgian fries is a, a local delicacy in Flanders. So that's where that one came from. The last one is a new race format. We'll see cyclists aiming to ride at exactly 20 miles per hour to work around new speed limits. Three, two, one. 
Go. So I guess this is like the speed limits that have come up in Wales and stuff. True. Um, I know it's true. It's true. Yeah. False. It's an April Fool's. It is an April Fool's. It was what? made up by, I think, okay, so this is the one that I added to the list thinking it was true. I but thought it, they had to. So there, there's like, there's British time trials and the organisers have been told that the riders, or they have to like recommend that the riders ride at the speed limit. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think that was a piece of news. Oh, and but I, someone and off I the back of it has made it. Off the back of it, they've oh, okay, said, right. so they're creating a specific race format where you try to ride it exactly. I think Look how that's, happy yeah. Jimmy is. Did I get all five right? You won. Your biggest win of Maybe, the year. Yeah. Was that like five nil to me? Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well done, everyone. <laughs> if your name's Jimmy. <laughs> Excellent game. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed that. You are very welcome. We should do that more often, but you make up the, the stories. Yeah, could do. Now for some news. People are hating on Rafa's latest jersey release, which has been banded as uninspired and looking like an AliExpress knockoff. Meme pages had a field day with this one. They did. It just looks like an old Rafa jersey from when they first... Which I think is meant to be the point, yeah. And and I'm pretty sure maybe 10 years ago they did a reissue of this kind of thing as well. They just do it every now and again. And it's a nod to jerseys from 50 years ago or whatever it was, you know, like... It's just a callback to history. So the kit brand unveiled their latest design earlier this month, a very simple black jersey with a large white band and the company's name across the chest in a bold, basic font. I have to say, the font is a bit... Rubbish. Yeah. It's it's a nice font. It just doesn't... That is the main problem, I think, with this jersey. The font feels too modern for a classic design. Exactly. The jersey was released, released even to celebrate Rafa's 20th anniversary and is a homage to the Tour of Flanders classic jersey of the past. Um, they say the Rafa logo has been reworked to in tribute to Tom Simpson's team in 1961. Tom Simpson, why do I know that name? He's the guy who died during a mountain stage of the tour. Wow. Mm-hmm. So the feedback from Rafa fans hasn't been that positive. One of the most liked comments on their Instagram post said, the new season colours are shockingly basic. No fun graphics, no brand identity beside a six-year-old arm strap. What's going on at Rafa? Why can Map slash Paz have cool creative stuff, but you can't? Another joked, can you please make the logo bigger? (laughs) That is quite good. Uh, And someone else said, the intent is great, but this execution just isn't it. I loved Rafa years back. Set a timer in the middle of the night to grab all those Japan collab fabric caps. Looked forward to all the seasonal releases. I'm sorry, but there isn't anything outstanding or fun anymore. Brand needs a zap of life. I think the main problem is the font. You have an interest in fonts. Francis, (laughs) what's your analysis of this font? (laughs) (laughs) I think it looks all right. Let's do a 20 minute deep dive into this font. It's all right. Sans serif thing. I guess it's it's like when you put Helvetica on a Cannondale yes. it doesn't quite work. Something about it. It's too modern to look classic, which I'm assuming maybe they want to update it, but then it's uh, ba- too basic to look modern. Why has this made the news? Um, <laughs> it's funny the things people catch on to, doesn't it? Yeah, it is. Like, yeah, it, it's They probably released it not as a massive deal and then suddenly it's been blasted every, everywhere. Totally, but any press is good press, right? Yeah, mm, we're talking well, about it. Not, not if all of the press is don't buy stuff from Rafa because they're out of touch. I think, number one, this was like an RCC limited release thing. So they always do kind of more off the cuff stuff. But I think that a lot of people thought it was basic. A lot of people also said like it looks like an AliExpress Timu knockoff thing. I like simple design. Um, I don't love the font with that jersey, but I do think it is still quite nice. Um, I guess based on some of those comments as well, I guess people are just... You know, like 10 years ago when, or eight years ago, whatever it was, when we were doing kit stuff, the the stuff that stood out was the really bold stuff, the yep. striking patterns. Um, and I feel like, you know, like there was a lot of people, including us, that were doing like fully patterned bib shorts. Yeah. And even when we were doing it, it was kind of like, why would you do that? Whereas, I don't know, maybe maybe that is evolved more. Maybe people now really don't want simple, basic There's way design. more pattern bib shorts and things being worn by people. Yeah, it's mad, isn't Definitely. it? Definitely. Yeah. Like the map staff, attacker, do some, like it's just mental kit. 
looks cool. Like, one of the things that Rafa is good at is kind of standing apart from the crowd and they're usually one of the first people to adopt new things. And maybe actually they're seeing that so many things are bright and bold that they've purposely gone very understated, but it hasn't quite hit the mark. For bear in mind, reason. they probably also have 50 jerseys. Jer- exactly, <laughs> this is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They probably do have wild ones. Do you think that it's hard to be original and fun in the sort of kit space now because it's so saturated? Yeah, absolutely. Like everything's being done one way or another. Yeah. So it's it, it always... I think now it really just comes down to preference. Like they will, like they will un- undoubtedly sell out of this jersey because some people will want it. Yeah, Cafe de Cyclist, they've started playing with different fabrics that you wouldn't usually find in the kit space, which is kind of interesting. I guess that's an sort of patterns and fabrics is a, is a place. You know, all jerseys end up looking the same. They, but I guess that's for a reason because they're performance garments in a way but during the malaysia trip this is a bit of a tangent i was amazed at how many other bike packers and tourers were using like just normal t-shirts flappy normal t-shirts and were visibly very uncomfortable and saturated in sweat yeah and it was just like horrible and it just was a reminder why technical clothing is a better choice because mm. i look at it and i go ah oh, i'd like I, qu- I quite like the idea of a t-shirt ride I really want to do that. I want to ride, you know, I want the photos that I look back on of a trip to be kind of in normal clothes, but it's just slow and uncomfortable and annoying. I guess Sadly. It, it kind of depends. Like, I, though, but I think it? maybe it's the type of riding we were doing. Yeah. Because we're is. not riding 40k a day. We're if, riding. If, if we were going to do like 70 miles or whatever. If, if we were going to do off road to Scotland and back over like a few days, yeah. you know, you could do that on a t shirt and you wouldn't even be phased by the fact that you're doing it in a t-shirt mm. and you'd be a bit more comfortable. The climate, isn't it? It's, if yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If, here, if you're riding in fine. 40 degrees with 100% humidity, then you don't want a, f- a, f- a sail on you that's absolutely drenched. There's the company as well, isn't it? I think uh, Ben, Lawrence and I, we, we all have ridden a like roadie style rides for a long time. And when we're like, right, we're going to ride the next section and we're, it's heads down. Like a lot of people don't do that. But if we were doing that in flappy stuff, you'd kind of be like, oh, it's a bit annoying that I'm wearing flappy stuff, isn't it? You should do a little knot mm-hmm. at the back. Oh, uh, yeah. Or oh, like Britney Spears. Yeah. Next, we've got to talk about the big crash at the Azulia Basque Country race. Tour de France defending champ Jonas Fingergaard broke his collarbone, his ribs, and suffered a collapsed lung. He's apparently stable, but still in hospital at the time of recording. Uh, Remco Ivanapol has a broken collarbone and scapula. Primoz Roglic went down but escaped without any fractures. Welp van Aert also broke a collarbone and ribs after a crash at the end of March. Uh, I did see the crash and it was hideous and horrible. Yeah, it was nasty. Oh. Uh, it actually reminded me of, of the crash or some of the crashes that happened at the Rio Olympics where there was these big, um, it was this massive descent and on the sides of the road there was these yes. huge storm drains. And it was the same thing here, wasn't it? It was an unprotected storm drain that, well, you know, if you end up in a storm drain, you're going to get hurt. That's what I fell into that in Malaysia. Storm drain? Yeah. Walking away <laughs> from a 7-Eleven, but they put paving slabs on top. Yeah. And then it just collapsed and my leg went through it. And obviously it's like a meter deep. Yeah. So I just kept going and I dropped my bike. And I think that's where I like, I damaged my bike and my, like, it just wouldn't stop bleeding. <laughs> I was like, what's happened? <laughs> One minute I was just walking and the next minute, Everyone's like, ah! <laughs> and I fell in a hole. So you are also out of the Tour de France this year. Storm drains are very big. Don't <laughs> cycle into them or walk into them. <laughs> now it was a really nasty crash. But this sort of means that two of the biggest GC content- contenders are now potentially out of the Vuelta and it's the Tour de all France. All the hitters. Yeah. So it could be Pogacar's path to victory. After I read this, my first thought was, I wish I'd seen it quicker and I would have gone straight down the bookies and put money on Pogaccia to win the Tour de France because if they're not in it, he's definitely won. 100% without fail. They w- they'll, be, they'll be in it, unless they're... But Vingegaard, so he's got a broken collarbone, broken ribs, co- collapsed lung. The Tour de France is under three months away. Oh, uh, okay. You... It was Vingegaard that had the most injuries. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Collarbone's a quick one. Yeah. They, you'll be back on the bike within a week, and a turbo at least. Ribs, though, that stops you from... Being in a good position it'll be or, very or put, uncomfortable won't, they it won't be able to put efforts in so it'll be hard to maintain the top end there's not much you can do with broken ribs you just leave yeah. it and hope and it's like toes i saw <clears throat> someone online saying could it be a comeback year for egan bernal 
He came third in the. He's he's had a Alter, lot of good results Catalonia. this year. Yeah, yeah. He's been I'm he's back. been simmering around yeah. a lot. Yeah. We will have to keep tabs on what's going on with this because obviously it makes a huge difference to the, the biggest race of the year. Yes. Get well soon. On a different note, did you see that one of the Ineos boys was disqual- disqualified over a sticky bottle? Oh. So 20-year-old Josh Tarling, is he one of your mates? It, I, I was my roomie in uh, Cape Rula, but when he was like 14 and we rode Paru Bay together as well, not the race, like uh, a sportive. And he was dropping me when he was like 14. <laughs> I'm glad he's actually good. <laughs> so Josh Tarlin suffered a puncture at the 143 kilometer to go mark. And he sticky bottled basically too long at too fast a speed to get back into the group. And there was a video of it. And <laughs> I can only, it looked like he was going 70 miles an hour <laughs> hanging on to a car. <laughs> I don't know how fast it was, but they, yeah, they definitely made a big effort to get him back on. Um, and yeah, rightly so, he got disqualified. Well, yeah. it's such po- it's just roulette. You do that to get back on a race, always. I've done that, all, all riders do, but usually like they don't care. Or you just do it at the right time and nobody sees. But th- or the TV cameras see it and then you get DQ'd and it's, that's harsh. That is well, harsh. Well, surely it depends <sighs> though how far and how fast. I think it should be a tough policy. If you get caught doing it, you're out. Well, I think there should be zero sticky bottle. Yeah. I don't think it should be allowed. What about magic spanner? What's that? It's like, None oh of it. no, there's something wrong with your bike. And then the, you're holding onto the car, getting it fixed for like five minutes. No, you should have to stop. <laughs> you should have to stop. It's part It's part of bike racing and has been for many, many years. It's not going to stop. Lotto Kopecky yeah. won Parube. Parube. In that race, there is a video of her taking a spanner from the car and, a, and re- tightening up her handlebars as she's riding. <laughs> And she still won the race. Skills. So Josh Tarlin, that's what he should have been doing rather than sticky bottling. Get well, yourself back on. He's very young, isn't he? You live and learn. You don't. I think uh, some of this go, comes down to the DS. Because you're, you're, your brain is like psh, a mess when you're racing. You're focused. You're, everything's going on. You just had a punch. You're getting back on. And your DS is like, come on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, do yeah, this, yeah, do that's this. true. That's you just true. do what they say, especially if you're 20. Mm-hmm. Like usually it's a fine. Mm-hmm. So uh, I've had a lot of fines. But <laughs> everyone has. Don't you think that this should just not be allowed? If you have a puncture, that's uh, surely well, part of the race. Well, maybe that's a bigger uh, that's like, question. Uh, surely part of racing is equipment, having the right tires, having knowing what pressures to use, maybe using tubeless on certain races. You know, like all of that is surely part of racing. Uh, like it's it is, changed over the like years. It, it used to be all other sports. It, well, it used to be you fix your own punctures, you do everything yourself. There's no team cars. But it has evolved and evolved and evolved. And now there's all these tactics involved with like how to get back onto a race. You know, the whole the convoy, moving through a convoy. It's it's part of racing. But surely holding on is is basically motor doping. Yeah, you but you lose so much time. If you have a puncher or you have a mechanical or there's a crash and you end up on the floor, getting back on the race is impossible sometimes unless you unless you do something like that. So you take the risk and that's part of it. Part of racing, therefore, should be you will potentially lose teammates and therefore that compromises. You know, that should be part of racing. It should be actually you've lost three teammates because they got punctures and they're not able to get back on because they're not strong enough or the race is going too fast. So now you are down to less team members. So that is now how I have to, how you have to proceed to the rest of the race. Yeah, maybe. I think it should just be flat out banned, not allowed. Every time I see it, I'm just like, how can holding on to a car be okay it's just it just doesn't make sense to me yeah but i agree with your point francis i think it's down to the people in the car yeah. well i mean it's down to everyone but also you know you can't just blame the rider time for another round of overrated or underrated i'm going to read out a list of things and you are going to tell me if they're overrated or underrated first up cable actuated hydraulic disc brakes so this is topical because you rode across malaysia with them underrated do you want to explain what they are yes it is a Cable actuated brake <laughs> hydraulic <caliper>. disc brake <laughs> hydraulic t- <laughs> with a small <laughs> reservoir of hydraulic fluid in the side. So it's a completely isolated system that fits onto your bike the same way any brake caliper normally would, uh, disc brake caliper. And then a cable runs through and it just pulls, and then the liquid then somehow <laughs> this is a really, the really bad explanation. Yeah, it's it. terrible, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, there's three types of disc brakes. Full hydraulic ones where there's hydraulic fluid that runs from the shifter to the caliper 
as you pull the shifter, it pressurizes the caliper, which closes them on the brakes. Full hydro system, that is the like expensive one. That's what all top end bikes will have. Then you have these where just the caliper has a hydraulic, has a uh, fluid system and a typical gear cable, a traditional rim brake, mechanical shifter. The cable pulls the caliper, which then has a clamp on the disc. And then you've got mechanically operated disc brakes where there is zero hydraulic fluid and a cable just pulls a piston onto the, the brakes. Basically, full hydraulic system is the best. Full cable system is the worst. There are some good and very expensive, however, mechanical systems. Some people swear by them. They think they're really, really good, but you do have to spend a, quite a lot of money to get one that doesn't feel sponge as f But it's still not, it's still just not in the same spectrum as a full hydraulic system. Nah. So, cable actuated hydraulic disc brakes, Francis used across Malaysia. We've got them on a bike somewhere else here as well when we've used them before. Um, they, well, they're not cheap actually, is it? £100 for one. So, front and rear, probably just £200. If you're looking at RRPs, like about £260 for a pair. Yeah. Um, however, if you factor in the, you don't need to use hydraulic levers, yep. then it ends up being a massive saving for brands to use on bikes if they're doing a full build. Or if you have cabled discs already and you want to upgrade to something much stronger, then it's a pretty good option. And uh, fairly easy to install. It's just a regular cable. You already have everything else going. They they are, I, I agree with you, they're underrated in terms of performance. I'm, I wish they were a bit cheaper. I think they'd be more accessible then. Because mm -hmm. I'm, I, like... There are cheaper options from companies like Z Race, Z Race, um, which is a um, AliExpress brand, I believe, and they work pretty well as well. I think the pads aren't aren't as good inside. If you want real peace of mind, I suppose that's what you're paying for with the TRP TRP High Roads, High Road, H Y R D. Because it looks like you can get 105 hydraulic brake set so shifters and calipers for about 300 quid at the minute that's a pretty good price yeah so it's kind of like this is why i don't this I, I like it i wish it was if they were 50 quid a caliper yeah then it's a good upgrade because it's an upgrade job isn't it yeah that, that's really what it is if you already have all the rest of the stuff i was saying that those one of five shifters i'm looking at right now are on merlin for 300 quid the rrp on them is 560 <laughs> so it depends whether you can actually get them cheap or not but yeah, over un, no underrated. Mm. Yeah, I think they're underrated. They're so so good compared to the cable discs. Um, in Malaysia, Lawrence had fully cable discs on his bike, brand new, and I, he was like, first ride, I can't stop. I honestly can't stop." And I was like, "They'll bed in, mate. They'll bed in. It's fine. We're riding some hills today. Just like squeeze them really hard. They didn't get any better. They were just spongy and horrible. And yeah. luckily, Lawrence is a good bike rider, and his bike wasn't that heavy, but." I was on 25 kilogram bike. Thank goodness that I had the hybrid calipers because they really do, they feel super strong, super strong. Next up, we have the Spring Classics. Have you read any of them? Read? Ro road, not read, road. Have you, have you ridden any of them? Uh, yeah. I've ridden every single cobbled climb and section there is in Belgium and France <laughs> at some point in time. I feel like that can't possibly be true. Every single cobbled road and section <laughs> in two entire countries. All the significant ones. <laughs> <laughs> All the ones that are featured in races. Yeah. I've done the Roubaix <laughs> thing, the Flanders Sportive. <laughs> the, the I rode thing. with uh, Johan Mazeo, the Lion of Flanders, and we did, a, it was like 10 hours of riding and he took in every single cobbled section that he knew around Belgium. Um, and that was incredible. The cobbles are so much bigger than you realize if you've never ridden before, um, especially Roubaix. What were you riding on, a gravel bike? I borrowed a, no, specialized road bike. I borrowed a, a rim brake SL five or four. How did you find that on the cobbles? It wasn't my bike, so I didn't care. But it was, uh, yeah, I. I also rode like an AliExpress bike, road bike on cobbles before as well. It was fine, but I was fitter then. 
Mm. So I was riding pretty fast on, on, on Josh Tarling's wheel. <laughs> so it was okay. <laughs> it's, it's like cars and speed bumps. The faster you hit them, yeah. the yeah, less yeah. impact it has. You have to ride fast. You act really fast. Mm. Did you see that uh, Van der Poel said that his, uh, or he said that road bikes are not particularly suitable for Paris-Roubaix? He, he said, full quote, I don't think Paris-Roubaix cobbles are meant to be ridden on a road bike before he then won on a road bike. <laughs> and, I, and I think that is a really good statement. And I think, obviously, he's an unbelievably elite athlete at the top of his game, but I think he's one of us. He properly loves cycling for cycling. And that statement is basically him saying, we do things because we are the top end of pro cycling. And that isn't actually how normal people should or do ride bikes. Mm. He's, I'm, I bet he's the kind of person that if you said to him like, oh, what bike should I get? He's obviously going to tell you to buy a Canyon because he has to. But he would probably say, get an endurance bike because it's more appropriate. The stuff that we do is actually bonkers. I think he's one of those guys. It's true. And I think that statement sums it up. He's always going to ride a road bike on that event because he is riding it to win the event. Whereas I bet if he went there with his friends and family for a jolly, he'd probably be on a mountain bike. Oh, if you ride a little bit slower, a gravel bike at least. The the cobbles, the Roubaix cobbles are honestly like this big Boulders. for the viewers at home. They're absolutely huge. And for huge. the non-viewers, about the size of a brick. Bigger than a brick. brick. Well, but like a breeze block. Not uniform either. And the gaps in between, there'll be like cobbles missing. Yep. Like people like they just get messed up by stolen. traffic or stolen. Yeah, yeah. And the gaps in between are absolutely huge. Which is why, if you watch it, a lot of the riders will ride in the gutter if you can. Yeah. Because it's faster. And that's more gravelly than a lot of the gravel people would want to use gravel bikes for <laughs> in the UK. Like, it is pretty extreme. Mm. Yeah, he said, going in Arenberg at 65 kilometers an hour has nothing to do with skill. It's just hoping the bike holds it. So there you go. Uh, what was the original question? The Spring Classics, overrated, underrated? Um, they're quite well... Rated. I think they're underrated. I, th underrated. I think they're wicked. Considering how popular the Tour de France is, yeah. yeah, they are underrated in that, if you compare it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think so too. They are, they're, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed watching them this year. It's just hard. Like the Paris-Roubaix is, is known as the hardest bike race, one day bike race there is. Um, because of the terrain and just, it's brutal. It's so long. Yeah. And there's not like a long, 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 long bit of basically neutralized breakaway section. It, it's, it, Start the selection starts to happen fairly early on. It's a fight the whole way through. It's a cool race. Next up, the gym. That's not me. That's uh, going to the gym. I'm overrated. I don't understand why so many people do it when you can just lift weights at home or do mobility or do resistance stuff in your own house. And then you don't have to go there. Well, typically the gym equipment is expensive. So to Do you like need all that stuff though. Well, even having like a set of weights and like a bench or whatever is going to set you back hundred quid. No, it's more than hundred quid. Nah, you can get uh, you can get a bench for fifty quid off Amazon, and you can get a bunch of weights which are maybe for the weights that you're for most pushing, people. But for the sort of stuff oh, that I need to yeah, push, you're basic. Yeah, you are like Arnie. I need a three hundred quid bench so that it can handle the mm. you know two hundred kilos. Jimmy doesn't even lift the weights anymore. He just lifts the whole machine. That's sick. Yeah. yeah. It's like just lifting the house. But the thing is, uh, gym <laughs> <laughs> gym memberships are expensive. Yeah. Really that, expensive. That's what I mean. And and then you've got loads of people there who are like in the way and sweaty and like you get sick it's, and like, I just thought you were touching some nah. There's quite a lot of gyms in this country now that are like 10 quid a month and they're like really good gyms, very well set out. The LA gym's pretty cheap that Danny goes to. That's about, that's like that kind of price. Two, two reasons for going to the gym are if you're paying for it, you kind of, in some cases you go, well, I'm paying for it. So I should make the effort to use it. Yeah. And also the best gym period of my life was about 12 years ago. And I used to go every lunchtime with two guys I worked with. And there, because there was three of us, there was always two other people going like, nah, you're not going down the pub or going down the gym accountability yeah mm. yeah and, and it is and, and also just like ideas like you'd be like right oh, I, I get bored of doing the same stuff over and over whereas one of my mates would be like actually we're going to do this today yeah cool let's try something new. i can see the appeal if um uh, people working in an office or even working from home it's a separate 
event in the day, isn't yeah. it? You're going somewhere to do this thing and you're focused on it without any distractions. Whereas I suppose I'm, I'm not really attracted to that idea because I'm outside so much. I'm either riding a bike or I'm on a, you know, cycling Malaysia. When I go home, I do anything to not leave the house just for like just a few days. I just want a few days of being indoors and working out in my front room is what I want to do. So it depends on the person, doesn't it? Mm. Still overrated. Isn't it weird that we've had to put in a human life has become so sedentary that we have to make a room where there's lots of heavy things to pick up and put down to be healthy. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? Because all we do is this, tapping on a keyboard and that's work. Well, some people don't. Some people have manual jobs. True. Not that, not enough people. Next up. (laughs) Aaron Taylor Johnson as James Bond. So there's been some talk about him being the James Bond. I think it was speculated. I think some people actually announced it and then it was then said, actually, no, it hasn't been officially announced, but there's, there's a high, there's been a lot of talk that he is very likely to be the next James Bond. So... I listen to I listen to a lot of podcasts, but I listen to an entertainment podcast that's like industry insiders. And they were saying that apparently, you know, every so often there will be like a oh, so and so's tip to be the next James James Bond, Idris Elba or Tom Hiddleston or whatever it is. Sometimes that's actually put out by their own PR company. Oh, very clever. Knowing that it will never happen. And if you say it, it's definitely not going to happen, but it gets people talking about oh, the should, person and it this. gets them roles. So I heard Jimmy was going to be the next James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we should do one. It's like Francis is signed with Ooh, Team yeah. Ineos to race, I don't know, something, the Olympics. I, I don't know. Does it have to be for people <laughs> to race the Olympics? With Team Ineos. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that one will stick. But anyway, uh, so who knows whether this was put out by... We'll work on that idea. By his own PR or not, but would you like to see him as the next James Bond? I've only seen him in Kickass. My first thought was no, but I think he actually could be quite good for it. He's he's a, he's an all right actor. You don't need to be a great actor to be James Bond because not a single one of them has ever been a great actor. Arguably, Pierce Brosnan. I think probably Pierce Brosnan's pretty good. He actually is an actor that became James Bond, whereas all of the others were either heartthrobs or physically there because of the physical side of it you know like sean sean connery he was there because he's just like he was 50s 60s 70s sex icon which, which one's craig to you i would argue he's he was neither no he's there because he he had the physique he had the act he, had, he, he the did not stuff. have the physique he did for bond he but he had to like do it yeah when they hired him he was like a skinny guy in layer cake but the my point is he was hired to be an action star, not to be a heartthrob. And he yeah. nailed that. Mm. Uh, Aaron, what's his name? Taylor Johnson. Aaron Taylor Johnson is a good looking guy. He's got the physique. He can do action stuff. He's an all right actor, but he's not fantastic. Uh, he's got, he's can be very posh, which is linked perfectly to James Bond. Uh, but he's also in films where he's actually just a bit raw as well, which I think is quite, appropriate from modern James Bond. I think he could be very good. So I'm going to say that is... Underrated. Underrated. Uh, do, uh, do you know what? I was just looking at what he's been in. I know him from Kick-Ass. I know him from Angus Thongs and Perfect Snogging, which is if you were... Uh... He's in Savages. Savages, if you haven't seen it, anyone listening, watching this, Savages is an incredible... It's a really, really good film and he is a great character in it. Godzilla, apparently he's in. Yeah. Oh, Nowhere Boy. That's a crap film. Sorry. <laughs> Well, he is in a lot of junk, to yeah. be fair. <laughs> Next up, Fluff Up of the Week. So, on a Monday, we have a Cade Media meeting, don't we? To decide what... M- management meeting. Management meeting. Usually in person, but I refuse to cycle to your house in seven degrees because it feels like minus seven. Yeah. Because I've been in 40 degrees for the last few weeks. So we realised we could just use the internet to talk to each other. Amazing. But anyway, you were sat at your table in your kitchen... And I noticed there was two clocks behind you. And straight away I thought, that must be, Francis's now wife lives in the States and that must be him putting one of the clocks to her time zone so he knows when to ring her. Genius. And then the more we looked, I was like, those two clocks are on exactly the same time. They're on exactly the same time because I've bought without checking and I didn't even know this item existed, atomic clocks, which... With a radio signal, they are always at the correct time. So you change them and then 
I'll be like, I oh, finally got it. LA time. Brilliant. And then it goes, whoop, and it goes back to exactly the same. Even the second hands are in sync. Wow. And you, they, you, if they've got a battery in, they're displaying the right time. What a great product. But I mean, terrible for you, mm, what you want to use for it for, but... Well, it, interestingly, this technology has been around for many decades and there are watch brands that also have it built into the watches. So whatever region you're in, it will pick up a radio signal and just automatically update to that. I was interested that you committed to it, though. You still have the two clocks on the wall. And now it's just funny. I <laughs> I, no one ever asks about it. No one ever notices. Do, do you remember when... Like there's, there's been maybe one or two times that we, well, usually I'm just like, look, we're going to, we're going to work this out. And like, I've kind of like started researching radio yeah, clocks. Then, then we make some adjustments as like, they're done. <laughs> Solved it. Taking the mechanism out and physically moving the hands would be the solution. But I don't know if that's doable. Realigning them. Because mm. the, the arms will just pull off and then you could just realign it to the correct hour and put it back in. We'll report back. We'll do that. Yeah. Let's hurry. Let's hurry. <laughs> Let's head over to your emails because it's time for listeners takeover. So a question from David from California. My goal this year is to finish one century ride per month. Oh, that's a lot that. He's uh, miles as well. Yeah. Mm. These have been mostly unsupported and there are not often places to stop and refuel mid ride. I've been using a small top tube bag on my specialized tarmac to carry extra food, etc. The problem I have is that the Valco straps on the bag tend to scratch the finish on my bike. I don't think I need a full tail fin rack setup, but I need a little more storage than a saddle bag. It seems like the solutions on the market are geared towards the gravel crowd. Can the team at Brainstorm, I'm not sure you're allowed to use that term anymore, uh, some storage solutions that are appropriate for a high-end road bike. Thanks in advance. So we need more storage than a saddlebag. That's like the largest piece of luggage. He means a little saddlebag. Oh, you mean like a little... Yeah, a little pouch there. Right. He wants some addition to that. So options are frame bag. Frame bag, top tube bag, bar bag. Bar bag, yeah. That's it. All of these are going to leave marks on your frame unless you use, and I'll caveat this, tail fin, sponsor trips when we go on them we're very close with those guys those are the pretty much the only bags on the market that don't scuff up your frame because they don't move yeah. they're whatever ratchet system they've it's, made it's all it rubber as well magic. Isn't it? and yeah it's all like rubber and they won't leave marks in your frame as long as they're tightened up properly you can just put frame protectors on yeah yes i used to use electrical tape a lot obviously it's it's unsightly but if I, if I was like doing a bike packing trip, I would use the electrical tape where my contact points are with a bit of extra either side. And I know I can just take it back off when I take the bags off, mm -hmm. um, which is also an option, which is cheap. Uh, it does sound like he, uh, David needs a frame bag and or bar bag. Bar bags are cool. They're a bit annoying. The stuff I put in bar bags are things that I don't need very often. Like I'm not putting food in a bar bag, but whereas like a top tube bag or frame bag, it's much more accessible whilst you're riding. Sounds like he'll be fine with a top tube bag because he has one already. Some people cannot ride with a top tube bag because it touches their legs mm. and it will cut your legs. I find the frame bag touches my legs. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Lucy had that problem. I brought her a tail fin one from here when we did a trip together. Yeah. Um, and we started riding within 40K. She was bleeding. Oh, God. Because some people's legs are just inny. Eesh. That's just how it is. You can uh, get saddle bags as well. Obviously, I think he was saying he was almost using like a sort of tool bag, saddle bag mm -hmm. type thing. But you can get larger saddle bags that hang from the yeah, back yeah. of it. Yeah, but like I mean, big ones as well. Can't it's, They're hard to access though. I would like... It's I, not going to be on the go. It's I like the top stop. tube bag because you can yeah. get stuff out of it right in front of you. Well, the, the big saddle bag is in line with a bar bag. It's the sort of thing that yes. realistically you're accessing it if you're stopping. Um, so it kind of depends what he's carrying what he needs for those kind of rides. You know, it might be like an extra bottle of water you can stick in your saddle bag so that when he is in the middle of nowhere after, you know, 80 miles, he can just jump off his bike, carry it out, swap his bottles around Bosch, carry on. Um, but there's loads of pack options out there. Uh, as Francis said, we have historically had a channel sponsorship with Tailfin. We do not currently, but they still do some bits and pieces with us. Other brands out there that are really good are... Uh, Apogura, they do loads of wicked stuff. Uh, Restrap. Restrap do wicked stuff. Restrap actually sells uh, what they call a frame protection kit, which is basically decals, stickers that you put 
So they've obviously realized that there's rub and yeah. they're trying to provide mm -hmm. a solution for that. And I've used stuff like that, not restrap ones, but stickers. What other ones are? I can't, they're, they're, well, at least in the UK, they're the main ones. Interesting that because they're all UK brands as well, isn't it? If you buy uh, one of those Canon, Canyon gravel bikes, it comes with a built-in bag that fits in. <laughs> Quite an expensive solution. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, and our Scottish mate, he does bespoke ones. Oh, yes, um, straight cut. Straight cut design. I absolutely love that dude. We did we did some bags with him back in the day. Skin grows back. Oh, Aussie brand. Austra Aussie yes. brand. Yeah, yeah. Really nice guy who runs that. Uh, so, yeah, there's some options. Check them out, see what they do. Hopefully, you find a solution. And good luck with your rides. But mm. don't put too much pressure on yourself. If you don't feel like it, you can stop. Just give up. <laughs> Sit <laughs> down. <laughs> Mr. Sit Demotivator. Down. <laughs> I'm going to get a T-shirt made, Mr. Demotivator. <laughs> Next up, we have a question from Ryan. I was out riding my bike recently when a driver made a close pass as I was approaching a huge pothole. The car was probably doing about 40 or 50 miles per hour. I was probably doing about 20. There was other cars behind which were also lining up to overtake. I was left with no choice but to try and bunny hop the pothole. I think that if I had hit it directly, I would probably have come off the bike. And with cars around me, that would have been very bad. Thankfully, I watched an old GCM video about bike skills years ago and bunny hopping was mentioned. So the idea to try it was in my head. So he'd never done a bunny hop before. I guess I should email them as well and say thanks. Anyway, I'm interested to know what skills you think a strictly road-only cyclist could use for their safety. Thanks, Ryan. That's actually a really interesting question. Being able to look behind you while going the same line. Mm. Useful. Yep. Unclipping nice and early. If you're using clipped in shoes. Gears and cleats is a, is a thing I always used to say. Get yourself in an easier gear and get ready to clip out. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually think hand signals fall into this as well. Yeah. So like I make lots of movement when I'm riding because I kind of work on the basis of I want road users to know what I'm going to do. So even if I'm going to move out to take a safer line on the road, I will put my arm out as if I'm indicating to go right so that the car behind me knows... I'm doing something which is ultimately blocking a chunk of the road. Um, so I think using arm signals and shouting at people and stuff is also a very good, important skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to think what I would do in that situation because there's absolutely no chance I'd be bunny hopping a pothole. I'm just, I think I would just slow down. Slow down to a stop if necessary. Would that be safe? I don't know what the answer is. Sudden stop in the road, unless there's not space. Yeah, and still cars. Well, I'm assuming up. in this case there wasn't space, otherwise you can just go around it. But potentially, what may help is sticking his arm out. Yeah, because if you a lot of the time, if you stick your arm out as an indicator, it, what a car does, it goes, oh, that put that. There's a cyclist in front of me, and they, I don't know what they're going to do. The worst yeah. case scenario is they go, I don't know what they're going to do, so I should probably just like chill out a sec. It usually buys you a bit of extra time to make a decision, make a maneuver. Um, it obviously doesn't always work. Um, but I, I kind of, I'm kind of with him. I'm glad he had the idea of bunny hopping. Yeah, yeah, totally. And, and it is sensible because sometimes um, when it rains up in the northeast, a lot of water ends up sitting on the roads. And our mate Harry Mack had broke his collarbone because he went through a puddle and it happened to have a massive pothole in it. So I don't like plowing through puddles. One because it's messy and you get wet, uh, even if it's not raining. But you don't know what's in that puddle. Do you know what he needed? What? Inflatable bib shorts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. His collarbone's all right now. That's good. Uh, I actually, interestingly, and I, that wasn't the point of us reading out this question, but I actually used my Garmin Varia radar for the first time ever last week or a couple of days ago. <laughs> and the bit, the bit I was surprised <laughs> at... For like a year. Have you been using it just as a light? Yeah, I hadn't turned the camera function on. Um, I don't like technology, okay? <laughs> There's too much of it. But it was part of your New Year's resolution, Jimmy, that you were going to start recording. Well, drivers. yeah, and, and, and I did. Well, so I, I got my new bike built up. Uh, I got, got everything working on it, and I spent the time to connect all my sensors and just get everything set up properly. Um, and what I was really surprised at with the radar is how far away the cars are at, at the first point that it notifies you that there's something there. Mm. So it's the, it's... Where it works really well in the lanes up here is is it allows me to go, actually, there's a, there is a car behind me, but I know it's like a decent way off. If I look up the road, 40, 50 meters up the road, I can see there's a big puddle or there's a big pothole. So it gives me plenty of time to move out and 
take a more dominant position in the road, knowing that their car is going to be catching up to me in, in, in the more distant future. And it's like far enough away that you can't hear them. Like you don't know there's a car there, but the mm. radar is, is telling you there's something there. And I was surprised how good that was. Also, there was someone which passed me that at the time I was enraged at because I was like, that was a close pass. I'm going to pull that up on the camera and I'm going to report them to the police. <laughs> And I then looked it on the camera and realized they were pretty much as far away as they could could be. It was like a single Yeah, truck. it was just a, a, a lane. So yeah. they were as, mo- pretty much all the way onto the other side of the road. But because it was narrow, it felt really close. And what the Varia also did was it tells me my speed and the speed of the other vehicle. So I was going 25 miles an hour and the car passed me at 61 miles an hour. So although it was about a meter away from me, meter and a half away from me, because it was going 60 miles an hour, it felt like it was inches away from me. And I thought that was actually an interesting lesson from that as well. Mm. We should say as well, we are sponsored, but this channel is sponsored by Garmin. It is, yeah. This section is not sponsored by Garmin, but the no. reason that we have the technology is because of that. Mm. They'll be well happy that you finally used the, the radar. <laughs> I was disappointed I didn't get to report anyone to the police though. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll report back on that in the future. Uh, what other skills should he learn? The thing that helped me most with my bike skills was commuting. And that was because there's a lot more situations where you have to speed up and stop your, your balance. Mm. The c- more comfortable you can get with your balance on your bike, whether that's being one handed, whether that's slowing down and trying to turn, whether that's trying to pedal softly, just everything like that. Be feeling confident and comfortable on your bike helps you in sticky situations, I think. That that is you yeah, you've just made me realise one uh or a dig down into one of the things you nailed there. Slow control at slow speeds. Cause I think that's why a lot of people get scared on when they're climbing as well. Yeah. Because you end up having to go really, really slow to be at an appropriate power or heart rate, however you want to man- monitor it, manage it. And people then start to feel like they're going to fall off because they're going slow. Mm. Whereas actually, if you get better at riding really, really slow, you realize that you, you, you're you not going to fall off. 100%. Does anyone else have trouble going turning in one direction when they're going <laughs> like slow? Like not an ambi-turner. Yeah, I'm yeah. not an ambi I find it very difficult to turn left. Yeah, I can't, I can't turn right yeah. as well as left. I'm assuming it must be something to do with dominant. I'm left-handed, mm. I can't turn left. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, I'm glad it's not just me because, no, yeah, true. if I'm ever going to fall off, it's going to be to the left. You want to practice um, turning while clipped in without unclipping a pedal Exactly. As well, that's like what that. it is. So yes. the Velociposse Cycling Club in London, they prioritise slow skill sessions instead yes. of like club rides or races and things like that. That's their main thing. Um, and a lot of them then end up riding track stuff off the back of it. And it's true. You learn the slow skills first and then you build it into the faster riding and it just makes you so much more confident. Because when you have loads of inertia and you're going quick, the bike just stays up, doesn't it? It's easy. Yeah. Like on the cobbles. Like on the cobbles. Exactly. You've made me realise why I can't turn left because I clip out on the right. Yeah. So there's something about the confidence of knowing you can put your foot down. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, 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 can, I can give you something which forces you to learn ambi stepping off cyclocross. Yeah. You have to be able to just get on and off any side it's just like you just have to mm, cool oh i forgot to put an end segment in oh god i thought you were gonna say you forgot to record Press it record. no <laughs> jimmy doesn't have an ending section script no let's just let him do it ready jimmy three two one go you have to say something about people can send the questions oh yeah i forgot about that bit uh okay if you have any questions for us send them to we are the wild ones <laughs> Send them to well, Wild Ones. Send them to Wild Ones Podcast at kmedia.co.uk. Thanks for listening or watching. If you are listening, give us a five star review and a like. If you are watching, give us a five star review <laughs> and a like. And don't forget to subscribe and say hello in the comments. See you on the next one. Yeah, that Yay! wasn't bad. Yay. Well done, well Jimmy. Well done, Jimmy, mate. Uh... <laughs> One year down. That's made me realise how much I rely on reading stuff (laughs) as we're doing this podcast. I've said that 44 times. Yeah, 44. Still don't remember it. The script will be there next week. I apologise. Well, yeah. See you on the next one.